Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 21. This is, comes just after Jesus' birth, and we see what happens directly after that. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given to him by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice, according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple when the parents brought the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. As we start, please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today and pray that you'll give us ears to hear and hearts to understand what you would have us learn from it. Amen. So when was the last time that you had to wait for something important? And I don't mean the sort of waiting where you constantly refresh the tracking page on the Australia Post website. I mean actually waiting. Was it worth the wait? Well, here we see Simeon and Anna, both of whom are waiting for Jesus. And we hear that they're waiting for Jesus. It forces us to ask, who is this Jesus guy anyway? Why were they waiting for him? Is he really that special? And this is a question that everyone who encounters Christianity is forced to ask at one stage or other. Because everything that the Bible says hinges on one person, the person of Jesus. And so we have to figure out who he is and what he said if we want to deal rightly with what the Bible says. If you do a quick Google search like every one of my generation does, you'll find lots of different answers to this question. Some people say that Jesus is just a nice guy Others, that he's a wise teacher or a guru. Still others suggest that he was a powerful revolutionary leader who was killed by a totalitarian regime. But who is he really? Is he any of those things? Is he all of them? Is he more? Well, that's what Luke is trying to tell us in this second chapter of his biography of Jesus. You see, back in chapter 1, Luke tells us that he's writing these things so that, we may be, so that we may have certainty about the things which we have been instructed. And so here in Luke chapter 2, Luke wants us to be 100% certain of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. So we meet Simeon and Anna. 
They're waiting for Jesus. But they don't know that they're waiting for Jesus until after they meet him. In verse 25, we see that Simeon is waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Lord's Messiah. In verse 38, we read that Anna is waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. What's a Messiah? What's the consolation of Israel? What's the redemption of Jerusalem? Well, all these are three different ways of talking about the one thing. They're waiting for God's chosen king. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word that just means an anointed one. It's the same word as that we find in the New Testament often as Christ. And that means the one that God has chosen to be king. And what does this have to do with the redemption of Jerusalem, the consolation of Israel? Well, throughout the Old Testament, we're told that God, when God's chosen king comes, he will bring comfort for God's people in their suffering. He will redeem them from the ones who hold them in slavery. So Simeon and Anna both wait. They wait for God's chosen king to come, for the one who will fulfill everything that was said about him in the Old Testament. And then, one day, a carpenter and his wife from Nazareth come to Jerusalem with a one-month-old baby boy. And suddenly, both Simeon and Anna know this is the one. This is the one they've been waiting for. This means Jesus is more than just a wise guy, a nice teacher, or a revolutionary leader. He is God's chosen king. He's the king who has come to redeem his people. This means we can't just take Jesus as a passing fad or some sort of nice sayings. No, Jesus is a king. And what he says needs to be taken seriously as commands from the king of not just Israel, but the world. Why does Jesus get to be king? What qualifications does he have? Did he overthrow the last king? Did he inherit the title from his dad? Was he like King Arthur? Did he pull a sword from a stone and suddenly that made him king? Well, none of these things make Jesus king. He didn't do any of these things. He gets to be king, firstly, because he's the one by whom and for whom the whole world was created. He gets to be king of the world because the world is his. But more than that, he gets to be king because he is the king who saves his people. He is the one who brings consolation and redemption to his people. Let's have a look and see what Simeon has to say about him. It's important to note here that both Simeon and Anna are not speaking their own opinion. Anna is called a prophetess. Simeon is said to be guided by the Spirit. That means the things that they're saying are coming from God himself. And Simeon says in verse 38, My eyes have seen your salvation. This king is the one who brings salvation from God. But what do I need saving for? I don't feel like I need saving. Well, God's chosen king is the one who saves us from our slavery to sin and death. You see, every time we act like God doesn't exist, when we pretend that we are gods of our own lives and try and usurp his place, we commit treason. And that treason demands punishment. That punishment is death. But Jesus, when he comes, he takes the punishment that we deserve when he dies on the cross. He doesn't die for his own sin. He dies for ours. And then, when he is raised to life three days later, he opens the way for his people to come back to God, no longer as his enemies under punishment, 
but as his children, beloved. He is king because in his death and resurrection, he invites us to be part of his kingdom, to join his mob and to say, he is my king. This is why Jesus is king. Now, you'd think that if God's king showed up and started offering salvation to everyone, that everyone would be pretty quick to get on board with that. But that's just not the case. Have a look at verse 34 and 35 with me. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus reveals our true inner thoughts, and he is a sign that will be opposed. Why why is a king offering salvation being opposed? Well, because we want to be king. When Jesus shows up and he claims to be king, that means we are not king. We don't have the right to live our lives any way we see fit. We don't have the right to behave however we feel like. Jesus is king, and that means we are not. And that's always going to be opposition because we really like being king. We really want to be king. We don't like being told what to do. All of us have areas in our lives where We'd rather not let Jesus be king, where we'd rather make our own decisions. Maybe it's how we spend our money, what we think about sex and relationships, how we choose to treat the people we don't particularly like at work or at home. Well, if Jesus truly is king, then these things are not optional. What he says about how we use our money how we think about sex, relationships, how we love our neighbours and ourselves, these are not just guidelines. These are commands. And so our job as his people is to listen to them, to take them seriously, and to let Jesus be king over all of our life, not just the bits that we want him to be king of. And this isn't going to be easy. When we start living like we are members of God's kingdom, that's going to bring opposition. One of the things I've noticed in political discourse lately is that when somebody doesn't like a leader, their dislike is not normally limited to just that one person. If you don't like a particular political leader, you tend to not like anybody who follows that leader. The same goes for King Jesus. Jesus was a sign that was opposed. People didn't like him and what he was claiming about the world. And that means anyone who doesn't like Jesus is not going to like anyone who follows Jesus. So we can take comfort knowing that all the opposition we face as God's people was faced first and foremost by Jesus. And that means we can turn to him when we are finding things difficult. We can talk to him because he understands. He gets it. He knows what it's like to be opposed. And he can help us through those times when we are opposed. But if Jesus is king, where is he now? What's he doing? Is he actually being a king? Well, the Bible tells us that yes, yes, he is actually being a king. He is seated at the right hand of God on his throne, ruling the world. But more than that, he's told us that he's coming back. He's told us that he's going to come back and vindicate his chosen people and show them that they were right, prove to their opposers that he really is king. And so he's given us a job to do while we wait for him to come back. And that's to live in a manner that shows that he is king and that proves that he is coming back. 
Often, before we had kids, Alyssa's job would mean that she had to travel for work, which meant I was stuck at home by myself trying to keep the place running. Now, I would know exactly when Alyssa was getting back. I'd have her flight number. I'd know when she landed, which meant that important jobs like the vacuuming, the dishes, and occasionally the washing were left until about an hour before she walked in the door. And then it was a mad scramble to get everything done just to make it appear like I'd actually been living in some sort of clean manner, even though I probably wasn't. But if I didn't know when Alyssa was coming back, if she just said, I have to travel for work this week, I'll be back sometime, well, I wouldn't be able to leave all the cleaning until the last minute because it was just as likely that she'd walk home and find the place a mess. If I didn't know when Alyssa was coming home, I'd need to make sure that the place was clean all the time and ready for when she came back. Well, Jesus, he hasn't told us when he's coming back. As he said, those times are not for us to know. And so now we can't leave our living for him until the last minute. We don't know when he's coming back. We need to be ready and ready now so that when he does come back, he doesn't find us asleep. What does it look like to be ready? What job has he given us? Well, that job is to live like members of his kingdom, to tell others and invite them to join God's people because of what Jesus has done for us. When you become a citizen of Australia, you're expected to abide by the laws of Australia. You don't become a citizen just by following the laws. No, no, you have to become a citizen. But afterwards, you're expected to follow the laws of Australia and live like you're a member of the Australian citizenship. Well, Jesus has given us citizenship in his kingdom. We don't join his kingdom by following the rules. Far too often we fall into the trap of thinking that somehow if we just live a good enough life that God will accept us into his kingdom, that God has to let me in because I'm not nearly as bad as that other people. But that's not the case. Jesus has done everything required for us to come into his kingdom. He is the king who saves his people who brings them comfort in suffering and redeems them from their slavery. He has done everything required. All we need to do is trust him. But now, as members of God's mob, as members of his kingdom, we need to live in a manner that reflects the values of that kingdom so that others can see that we are part of King Jesus' mob, that we live for him. And that way, when he returns, he will find us ready and waiting to join him forever. As he has said, who is this Jesus guy anyway? He is God's chosen king, sent to bring salvation to anyone willing to accept it. This is why Simeon and Anna thought that meeting him was worth the wait. This is why we eagerly await his return, because he is king. He invites us to live as part of his kingdom and now expects us to live in a manner that shows that we are part of his kingdom. Not because that gets us entry, but to show that we are already in, to show that he is already king and living for him is what he expects. Because he is king, we can't take his words lightly. We can't pick and choose which of his commands we follow and which we ignore. They are commands from a king. And we need to make sure that we let Jesus be king over our whole lives, not just the bits we feel like letting him be in charge of. When we try and be God, we commit treason against him. But God has sent his chosen king to take the punishment we deserved so that we might live forever with him in his kingdom. Our job 
is to live as members of his kingdom so that when he returns, we are not found sleeping at the gate. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have sent your king not to condemn us but to save us. And we pray that you will equip us to let him be king over our whole lives so that when he returns we will not be found sleeping but that will be, we will be ready to join him, living with you forever. Amen.